how close we train to failure is a fundamental concept of resistance training. But how close to failure should we be training? Should we take all sets to failure all the time? When is it a good idea to leave a few reps in the tank? And does this differ for hypertrophy versus strength training? First, we need to define what exactly failure means. In a general sense, failure is when we train until we literally fail to complete a rep. So true failure is when a rep is attempted but cannot be completed despite maximal effort. Furthermore, there can be differences in what failure is based on how it is defined. Is failure when you can no longer complete a full repetition with perfect technique? Or is it okay to use a little momentum to get a few more reps? What if we can still perform 50% of the range of motion? Does that count as true failure? Ultimately, I think this comes down to the intent of your training. When training for muscle growth, it is more about reaching what I like to call muscular failure. This is when we reach failure due to the target muscle being fatigued. So our definition of failure in this case is probably going to be based on whatever can be helpful to produce a superior hypertrophic stimulus. For example, it might still be beneficial for muscle growth to complete a few extra partial reps during a row or pull down, even if we can't quite complete the full range of motion. Whereas when training for strength, we might be more concerned with what I like to call task failure. This is more objective in the sense that there are clearly defined rules and regulations as to what is considered a legal rep or not. And if you didn't complete a rep within these constraints, it is considered failure, irrespective of what muscles were stressed. For example, failure for pull-ups might be defined as when you cannot get your chin above the bar in the context of strength training. So based on the point of failure, we can also define our proximity to failure based on the number of reps left in reserve. This is a scale which tells us how close to failure a given set is taken. Failure, as we have defined, means that a rep was attempted but wasn't completed. Zero reps in reserve means that no more reps were able to be performed, and if another rep was attempted, then you would have failed. One rep in reserve means that you would be able to perform one more complete rep if you wanted to, but stopped just before that. Two reps in reserve means you could have performed another two reps, and so on. Now that we have defined what failure is, let's discuss how close to failure we should train for muscle growth. In a general sense, muscle growth can be achieved when training even with a fair number of reps in reserve. However, training closer to failure typically produces greater muscle growth. This was observed in this meta-regression, which aimed to establish the relationship between proximity to failure and muscle growth. In this regression, there were two important concepts found. First was that significant muscle growth can be achieved even when training quite far from failure, as much as 10 reps in reserve. And second is that training closer to failure generally results in more muscle growth. So for some practical recommendations, I would say that most people should be training with at least 5 reps in reserve if they are aiming to build muscle in most cases. And for those who want to maximize muscle growth, it is probably better to train closer to failure, taking each set at least 2 reps in reserve. Furthermore, it is also kind of possible to train beyond failure in some cases. Essentially, there are some strategies which can allow us to continue lifting even after failure has been reached. For example, partial reps can be used to perform more reps once full range of motion failure has been reached. But is this effective for muscle growth? This study compared the effects of performing calf raises with two different failure definitions. 23 untrained men performed 3-4 sets of 10-20 to 20 reps of single leg calf raises for 10 weeks. One leg trained to failure, defined as being able to perform the full range of motion. So if they were unable to fully plan to flex the ankle, the set was stopped. The other leg trained with a full range of motion until reaching failure too. However, the set was then continued with a partial range of motion until they essentially couldn't perform any calf raise at all. It was found that both legs experienced increases in gastrocnemius muscle thickness, but a little more growth was seen in the leg training beyond failure. So for some exercises where it is feasible, it might be worth extending sets by training with a partial range of motion. This works well for many exercises like bicep curls, rows and pull downs, leg extensions and leg curls, and calf raises. However, it isn't really feasible for other exercises such as a barbell bench press or squat. 
Another way to train beyond failure is by performing drop sets. Once failure is reached, the load can be reduced and additional reps can be performed. This study compared the effects of performing bicep curls using traditional versus drop set training. Nine untrained men had each arm assigned to one of either three bicep curl training protocols two to three times per week for eight weeks. One condition involved performing three sets to failure at 80% 1RM. The second condition involved three sets to failure at 30% 1RM. And the third condition involved performing one set at 80% 1RM to failure, followed immediately by four additional drop sets with a 10-15% to decrease in load, with all drop sets also taken to failure. It was found that biceps cross-sectional area increased similarly in all three conditions, with no notable differences between them. This suggests that a post-failure training strategy like drop sets can be effective for muscle growth. This can be used to either extend a single set in order to produce a superior hypertrophic stimulus, or drop sets can be used to replace traditional sets for a more time-efficient workout. Furthermore, how close we train to failure might also be influenced by the load used. Some evidence finds that it is more important to train closer to failure when using lighter loads and less important when using heavier loads. This was seen in this study, which compared the effects of training to or not to failure with different loads. 25 untrained men performed single leg leg extensions for 8 weeks. Subjects were randomly assigned to perform 3 sets with either 80% 1RM or 30% 1RM. One leg performed 3 sets to failure. The other leg performed 60% of the reps achieved in the failure protocol and performed as many sets as it took to reach the same volume load. It was found that both legs training with 80% 1RM saw similar increases in quadriceps cross-sectional area. The leg training to failure with 30% 1RM also saw similar increases as the 80% condition. However, the leg training with 30% 1RM not training to failure saw significantly less growth. So, for some practical recommendations, when training with less than 10 reps, training with no more than around 3 reps in reserve would be sufficient to near maximize muscle growth. When training in the 10 to 20 rep range, we probably want to train with no more than around 2 reps in reserve. And when training with more than 20 reps, it might be necessary to take each set at least 1 rep before failure to maximize muscle growth. Now let's move on to strength training. How close to failure should we train when it comes to strength gains? Well, the same meta-regression also established the relationship between proximity to failure and strength gains. Unlike hypertrophy, there was no significant effect of proximity to failure on strength. Importantly, it should be noted that this analysis only included studies which compared different proximities to failure that used the same load between conditions. So essentially, this tells us that the load on the bar is what is primarily driving strength gains rather than how close a set is taken to failure. And even though proximity to failure doesn't really seem to influence strength gains, we might need to train closer to failure in order to accommodate load increases. Since heavier loads produce greater strength gains, eventually we need to increase load on the bar to get stronger. And at some stage, load will increase to the point at which you are already close to failure, even after performing only one rep. So, as a result of lifting heavier weights, you will probably naturally need to train closer to failure anyway. Although proximity to failure isn't really something that we need to focus on for the main strength lifts, what about accessory lifts? The goal of accessory lifts in a strength routine are generally to grow the muscles which are primarily used in the strength lifts. This is because a bigger muscle will provide more contractile tissue to contribute to force production during the strength lift. So for accessory lifts, a more hypertrophy-focused training approach is usually taken. This means higher reps, lighter loads, and training closer to failure, since that is what tends to produce the best muscle growth. So for accessory lifts, we probably want to intentionally train close to failure for the purposes of maximizing muscle growth. Next, let's cover how proximity to failure influences fatigue. Generally speaking, training closer to failure is more fatiguing. It tends to result in greater performance decreases in the hours and days following training, greater muscle soreness, and greater psychological fatigue. This was seen in this meta-analysis, which compared the effects of training to failure versus not to failure on different markers of fatigue. 
it was found that training to failure resulted in greater decreases in performance, a greater metabolic response, more muscle damage, and a higher perceived fatigue compared with not training to failure. And while this may seem unfavorable, fatigue is not necessarily a bad thing. Fatigue is just a part of training and part of the adaptation process. If training is disruptive enough, it causes fatigue. But we then adapt to the training stress and recover from the fatigue. So if we try to avoid fatigue at all costs, we may be limiting the training stimulus which causes the adaptation in the first place. That being said, we probably want to limit unnecessary fatigue if it doesn't contribute to the stimulus we are after. Furthermore, we are also able to adapt over time so that the same training stimulus causes less fatigue. Once you become accustomed to training close to failure, it becomes less fatiguing. For example, this study compared the fatigue induced by resistance training in an untrained versus trained state. 10 untrained men performed the bench press and squat for 3 sets of 5 reps with a 10 rep max load. They then underwent a 10 week training program before repeating the same protocol once again. After the first training session, it took around 48 hours for performance to recover. But after the training program, lifting performance was back to baseline within 24 hours. So what does all this mean with regards to how close to failure we train? Well, it just means that we might decide to train a little closer or further from failure depending on our current goals and context. If you want to maximize muscle growth at all costs, then you probably want to train to or very close to failure. You will induce a little extra physiological and psychological fatigue, but it comes at the benefit of a little extra muscle growth too. But for some people, the fatigue cost might not be worth the small hypertrophic benefits. These people might decide to leave a few more reps in the tank of each set in order to get a good stimulus without excessive fatigue. And if you have some sort of event that you want to be in your best condition for, it is probably best to avoid training too close to failure within the 48 hours leading up to it. For example, if you have a sports match of some sort that you want to perform well in, then you might decide to train a little further from failure the day or two before. Or if you are simply mentally fatigued from other life stresses, then you also might decide not to train as close to failure to avoid unwanted psychological stress in your life. And lastly, it is also worth touching on safety. Training to failure can be a little dangerous on some lifts. Specifically, training to failure during a barbell bench press or back squat can be injurious or potentially fatal if you are alone with no safety spotters. I think we all know this, but it is just a reminder that the small additional gains you might get from getting that last rep are probably not worth the risk if you were training alone. To maximize safety, make sure you have spotter arms set up on the rack or have someone spot you if you were going to train very close to failure. Or if you are bench pressing alone with no safety spotters, don't put the clips on the ends of the barbell so that you can at least slide the weights off if you get pinned. And this safety issue only goes for a select few exercises. Most exercises you can train to and beyond failure as much as you like without any significant injury risk. In summary, let's recap what we have discussed. For hypertrophy, training closer to failure generally promotes greater muscle growth. To maximize muscle growth, you probably want to leave no more than around two reps in reserve on each set. There are also ways to sort of train beyond failure, which might be even further beneficial for muscle growth. And it seems that training closer to failure may be more important when lifting lighter loads compared with heavier loads. In terms of strength, proximity to failure has no significant effect on strength gains. It is the load lifted which has the largest impact rather than how close to failure you train. However, lifters will eventually need to train close to failure to promote further strength gains as more load is added to the bar. And also, accessory lifts aimed at growing the prime movers of a strength lift should be trained close to failure to maximize muscle growth. Training closer to failure also tends to produce more fatigue. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, and to some extent it is just a part of the adaptation process. However, some people might decide to train a little further from failure at certain times to limit overall stress and fatigue. And lastly, make sure to be safe when training to failure. Don't train to complete failure on exercises where you can get pinned or injured if you were training alone.
Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.